All right, we're going to go ahead and get going now. Um, we have a few things to get through, so hopefully more people can get in as we talk. So hello and welcome. My name is Kathy Hoverman, and I'm moderating today, today's webinar from the ASCE Environmental and Water Resources Institute and AFS's bio, Bioengineering Section Joint Committee on Fisheries Engineering and Science. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on our YouTube channel. The series began in 2015 to share information on aquatic organism passage, dam removal, and fisheries improvement, and other related topics. Since the inception, we've provided free quarterly webinars, with today being the fourth and final in our webinar series of 2022. A couple announcements. Um, you can find our prior webinars or sign up to get direct notice of new webinars on our website, uh, which is listed over on the right side of your screen. And also uh, the joint committee, we do more than just webinars. We also um, uh, keep a conference going. We have a white paper listserv and um, we also give out awards for really awesome projects. So um, if you wanna be a part of our committee and help us connect across the country and around the world on these types of projects, uh, please feel free to reach out to anybody listed here. That's our executive committee. And they'd be happy to tell you what the process is to join our committee and help share this information. I want to give a quick shout out to my fellow uh, webinar task force folks. Um, they're listed over there on the right side. Andy, Mike, Toby, Rachel, and myself. Um, these folks do an amazing job of bringing people together using their contacts and their collaborative um, nature to be able to bring the speakers to bear and uh, bring us relevant content and high quality speakers and information. So good shout out to them. And because of all that, we also have our entire 2023 se speaker series lined up, which you'll see in the middle of the page there. All right, with that, I am going to move to our speaker. Today is George Pess. He has worked in fisheries since 1989 with a primary research interest in the examination of natural and land use effects on salmon habitat and salmon production. George is a program manager for the watershed program at NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center and an affiliate professor at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fisheries Sciences. He has conducted research on historic and current land use impacts on salmon habitat and production the influence of wood in forested stream channels and how landscape characteristics and land use affect salmon abundance. George's current primary research project includes the ecosystem response to the removal of the Elwha River dams. And that is what George is gonna to talk to us about today. So we are very lucky to have him. And uh, George, thank you for being here. Welcome, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, hand it over to you so that you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you very much. And thank you all for uh, inviting me today. Can, uh, can you see my screen at this point? Yes, looks okay. good. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I feel very lucky that I've been asked to uh, give the talk today. And uh, just want to acknowledge um, with this initial slide uh, that I'm going to be talking about ecosystem response to the removal of the Elwha River dams and go over a lot of different things with, re with regards to the dam removal. As you can see, I don't have any individuals on the title slide because there were so many individuals and so many groups that have been involved in the Elwha over the last two decades. So particularly I want to acknowledge the Lower Elwha Klallam Tribe, uh, the National Park Service, and also uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as everybody else here uh, involved. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over a little bit uh, about dam removal in general, and then talk a little bit about the Elwha prior to dam removal, mention the Elwha River Ecosystem and Fisheries Restoration Action Act, and then talk a little bit about how dam removal happened. The primary focus of my talk today is going to be on what has occurred since dam removal, and that's going to be a function of location, sediment, salmon, and the ecosystem, and then I'm going to try to summarize. Uh, a lot of the great underwater photos that I'm going to show you today are by John McMillan. Uh, these are two pink salmon. And then also the one uh, below that is uh, Glines uh, Dam being removed. Uh, that's the uppermost dam. And that person with the red backpack is a little over six feet tall to just give you context. So there's a lot of dams that have been built across the world. And if you look at our neck of the woods, we have quite a few. Um, 
But what's been going on is that dam removal has occurred in the United States, particularly since the mid 1980s. Um, you can see on the upper left hand corner here. And then also in the upper right hand corner, you can see where those dams have been removed over the last 30 years. Now, most of these dams that have been removed have been less than 10 meters in height. Uh, most of them looking like this mill, mill town dam here uh, uh, on the bottom right hand corner. But in our in our, in our part of the world where we have large mountains, we also have large dams. So whether we're talking about the Elwha or the white salmon uh, or the Sandy or the little Sandy, or even the ones that are going to be removed on the Kalamath, they're, they're, they're larger dams. And so again, today I'll be speaking about the Elwha. So uh, the Elwha River is located uh, in the Northwest section of uh, Washington state on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, you can see here in the far left where it is and then if you look at the uh, kind of middle upper part of the of the graph here, you can see that the vast majority of the Elwha is actually in Olympic National Park. So uh, I would say over 80% of it is actually in Olympic National Park. And these two dams, though, were built prior to the park in the early 1900s, and they basically blocked off over 90% of the habitat. They did not have any fish passage at the time, even though there was actually fish passage laws in place. So the Elwha is not that atypical. It's actually, uh, it's the average size of a typical Puget Sound River watershed. It's a little over 800 square kilometers and it drains from the south to the north to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, it has a little over 70 kilometers of main river habitat, but it has eight major tributaries that total the amount of potential anadromous habitat to over 120. And it goes from basically a little bit over 1300 meters down to sea level. And it's typical in the sense that it, we have dry, warm summers and cool, wet winters in the Elwha. It has a mix of geologies and, and your typical Western Washington uh, forest. It also, what's kind of unique about the Elwha, it has a lot of different salmon species. Um, you know, historically had basically all the salmon species that we see in the, in our, in the lower 48 here, uh, including sockeye salmon, um, and also has bull trout, ulicon, and lamprey, and a variety of different uh, sculpins as well. So we kind of had all the players basically uh, in the Elwha historically. Now, it's also a very typical watershed where, you know, historically you could kind of walk on the backs of salmon, a lot of fish coming back, almost 400,000 estimated annually, post the dams and post all the impacts from harvest and hatcheries and and habitat degradation, you know, basically we were seeing thousands of fish return. But one thing that people don't really take into account is that species composition shifts also when you see a decline in abundance for a variety of species. So historically pink salmon were the dominant in abundance. And today we see Chinook followed by coho, or actually it's coho followed by Chinook and steelhead. Um, but really the bottom line is, is all the native populations are in very low abundance. So the Elwha Act was passed in 1992 um, for the removal of the dams and full restoration of the Elwha River ecosystem and native anadromous fisheries. It was pretty unique. Um, now remember, this act was passed in 92 and the dams didn't start coming out till 2011. So a lot needed to happen between uh, then and, and 2011. And these are two uh, Chinook salmon that you're seeing here. So really the biggest issue with the Elwha was what was gonna happen to all the sediment. There was over 21 million cubic meters of sediment associated with the reservoirs. Here on the right, you're looking at former Mills Reservoir uh, Delta, uh, waters flowing towards you. And most of that uh, material in both of the reservoirs was finer material, sand or less, but quite a bit of coarse. And they predicted over half of it to actually be eroded downstream. Now, there was a lot of predictions, really high suspended sediment levels, the temporary deposition of fines in, in slower water habitats, a more dynamic connection with the floodplain and the buildup of the riverbed, particularly in the lower river, and then obviously the dramatic change in the estuary. So those were all predicted to occur with the dam removal. So the Elwha Dam was located at River Kilometer 8, and this is what it looked like literally the day uh, before dam removal started. Um, and there was a little less than 5 million cubic meters of sediment, most of that being silt and clay that, were, that was deposited behind this dam. And the way this dam was taken down was that um, basically there was a coffer dam built upstream and the river was shunted to one side of the river valley. 
and then the dam was removed on the other side of the river valley. And then again, the, the coffer dam was moved and then the river was shunted to the other side until several months after 2011. So this is actually, um, this picture is taken in August, 2012, but by April, 2012, that we had passage in the lower, uh, for the lower dam. Lyons Canyon Dam is a little bit different story. That's located at river kilometer 20, Two, it was over 64 uh, meters in height uh, and it had over 15 million cubic meters of sediment associated with it, most of that being sand and gravel. So the way this one was taken out uh, was basically a floating barge with a jackhammer on it, um, as I call it, the OSHA nightmare. And uh, it was floated back and forth across the uh, top of the reservoir and a couple feet of the dam was taken out every day. Now, eventually, there was no more, the reservoir wasn't uh, big enough anymore to hold a floating barge. So we had, to, there was, uh, equipment was helicoptered in to deconstruct the dam. And eventually dynamite was used on the lower part of, of the dam itself, eventually leading to passage. So the way, again, I'm gonna talk most of the day uh, or most of the time that I have today with you on uh, what has occurred with the removal as a function of location. So spatial location, meaning, um, you know, the dams and the former reservoirs, the near shore and the river ecosystem, and then process. So how the sediment dynamics and fish uh, reoccupation happened as a, uh, and how that affected the river food webs, terrestrial linkages and revegetation. So what you're seeing here is a graph of uh, turbidity on the X, on the Y axis and time on the X axis. And those spikes are obviously associated with the dam removal. So I'm gonna try to show you a lot of information in one graph here. Basically when dam removal started was in September, 2011. And you can see that increase that is occurring. So here's the lower dam. Uh, this is uh, lower, this is Elwa Dam at kilometer eight. And this is a, a LIDAR image of the mouth of the river. So that'll give you an idea of when the Delta was actually starting to formulate. So by April of 2012, the lower dam was out and we saw this huge influx of fine material. So if I could put everybody in a boat and we could go back in time, we could actually be in this boat and cut through this uh, turbidity and we would see clear water a couple inches below. So this is all finer material that's kind of floating to the top of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, and then you could see that the, the estuary really didn't change that much. Really though, Things started to change in um, basically October of 2012 when the entire Mills Reservoir area, or former Mills Reservoir area, was exposed to erosion. So the bottom photo here shows you what it looked like prior to the dam removal. The um, the Mills Reservoir going from right or from left to right here is a totally exposed again, but nothing really downstream. But you could see how how high the sediment levels were for literally year round for two years. So by October of 2014, we had the dam, the upper dam out, and you could see how dramatic change occurred in the estuary itself. And then we were getting pulses, seasonal pulses of sediment, but really still high levels of sediment because the reservoirs were still eroding. And then we had a couple of large flood events uh, starting in 2015, November 2015, which also added to the evacuation of sediment. And then by 2016, we were literally down to background levels for the river. So if we were standing in 2009 at the mouth of the river, this is what it looks like on the left. On the right, you can see what it looks like seven years after dam removal. We have an estuary, we have a huge uh, beach in front of us here with uh, emergent vegetation coming in. Uh, a totally different sound. If you were standing in 2009, you would hear cobbles being, you know, moved around by the ocean, by the waves. But here you would see it on the right, you would hear a quiet sounding sandy beach. So there were some major changes, obviously, in the reservoirs as well. The, the red circle denotes Boulder Creek coming in from river uh, left uh, and water's flowing from the bottom to the top here. So if we were able to go back in time, um, and, and, and stand at the mouth of Boulder Creek when the dam started to be removed, we would see this is what Boulder Creek looks like. So water is flowing away from you here. Um, by 2019, this is what it looks like. So the same place where the red arrows denoting is where we were standing is a couple meters basically above where the creek is now because the creek had to 
kind of basically keep up with the reservoir down cutting. Um, and we have both Chinook and Steelhead and even Coho up in here now as well. So one of the questions that was posed was how has the freshwater habitat downstream of the dams changed with the change in sediment supply? So this is uh, data from Chris McGurl and others looking at the change in riverbed elevation going uh, on the x-axis through time and on the y-axis is the elevation. So you can see when dam removal began. When the Elwha Dam was removed, we saw a slight change in the riverbed, but it really wasn't again until that Mills, former Mills Reservoir was exposed to erosion that we saw a dramatic increase in the bed material or the bed load. And that's when we saw a change in the elevation of the river up to two meters in some places. And so one of the things that we were doing is how does a river respond to this change in sediment? So here you're looking at a Google image, you're looking upstream towards um, uh, former uh, Glines Canyon Dam. And uh, the red lines, and I apologize for those that are uh, colorblind, um, I should have probably used a different color. Um, those are floodplain channels. So for every kilometer of main stem, uh, we have one to two kilometers of floodplain channel associated with that. And so there we could see how the gravel bars developed and what accumulated, how the pools filled in in the, in the main stem, and then also how we had large scale changes in bank erosion as a result of the aggradation that happened in the main stem. So if we were standing at Fisherman's Bend looking upstream in October 2012, this is what you would see on the left. But by, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's not even a year later, we would see a dramatic change with gravel bars and logs and a much turbid river, more turbid river, because that's when active dam removal was happening. So what happened during that time period is that if you note here, this is a long profile. And the green denotes deep pools here. Uh, but basically, all those pools by November of 2012 were literally filled in with finer material. And once the bed actually started to build up in the main stem, is that's when we actually got large scale channel shifts. So before that, we weren't getting really large scale channel shifts, but we were getting channel change. Once those beds, once the bed filled uh, and we started getting bed material, that's when we started to get bank erosion and channel avulsion. So all the areas in the black here on the left were basically eroded and the channel migrated across its entire floodplain. So in sum, what we saw was the pools filling and unfilling in the main river, followed by this mid-channel bar development and wood accumulation, and then also the uh, floodplain channels filling and stabilizing, and then the floodplain actually seeing sediment as well. So in summary, we had um, a little over 21 million, well, we had a bunch of sediment released, not necessarily 21 million cubic meters, but quite a bit. Um, and about 10 to 11% was stored in the river, but the vast majority, over half, went out into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the third almost deposited as the delta or the estuary that we see today. So one of the other questions that people always ask is, well, can salmon recolonize these newly formed habitats? Um, um, and the, the short answer is yes. So whether we're talking about a population of let's say 300 steelhead prior to dam removal in the Elwha that now is somewhere around 2,400 or so, um, or the Cedar River where we have hundreds, or the Fraser River where we have over a million pink salmon, when you when you open up these new areas within 10 to 20 years, you could actually see a pretty large scale population response of one to fourfold. And so the reintroduction that occurred in the Elwha was uh, two different methods. One was assisted relocation during the, particularly during the high turbidity levels as part of the biological opinion where uh, protection of things like steelhead and, and Chinook were, were mandated by NOAA. Um, and so that was part of the hatchery program but there was also obviously natural reintroduction for those species as well as others. And so really the Elwha was a combination of relocation that occurred with adult fish in some cases to clear water tributary habitats for a short period of time. And then also obviously the larger scale natural reintroduction that is that has been occurring. So we had to try to measure all this and you saw what the turbidity levels like are like and and I like to make this joke and I don't know the thing about the virtual stuff you can't hear people laugh so I'm going to make it anyway. But uh, I always say that salmon are a lot like trees, except you can't see them and they're constantly moving so they're really easy to enumerate, which is not the case, obviously. 
But we tried a bunch of different methods. And one of the methods that ended up working for us quite well was a sonar because of the high turbidity levels. Now we complemented that with other methods such as traditional red surveys and other things, but the sonar has become a real tool for us for enumerating not only Chinook, not only steelhead, but now coho salmon as well. So we had two sonar uh, units uh, that we've been uh, managing uh, that the Lower Elwha tribe has been managing basically. And Keith Denton is their contractor who's been doing a lot of the work, but we've all helped out. Uh, in the lower river here to basically get an enumeration for all the all the fish and so um here what you have on the left is basically the sonar hanging off a home depot ladder so an eighty thousand dollar piece of equipment hanging off uh something from home depot and what you have here is a picket fence to kind of push the fish away from the sonar but this has worked out quite well for us and basically we've been able to enumerate with a coefficient of variation um of about less than you know 5% in most years. So the question is, have we seen more fish? And the short answer is yes, we're starting to see quite a few more fish. Uh, sorry about this. I don't know why it keeps popping up like that. But um, anyway, we started with a little less than 3,000 uh, Chinook and we're now we're uh, over up to about 5,000, almost 8,000 in one year. Uh, for steelhead, it's been a little bit more pronounced. Now I will say that there's a hatchery component, a quite a large hatchery component to the Chinook, not nearly as much with the winter steelhead and a summer steelhead are a totally different story, but we started with less than 500 winter steelhead and, and I think our last estimate is over 2000 for this year. So we're seeing quite a bit of a change with steelhead as well. One of the bright spots has also been coho where now we're seeing an average of about 5,000 return where we had probably, I would say less than a thousand prior to dam removal. Again, mostly hatchery fish, but these fish have actually, we've done some tagging studies to show that there's natural origin uh, spawners now as a result of these hatchery fish. We've also done measurements of juvenile salmon, looking at small traps and into year summer populations using a variety of different techniques. The small traps or the screw traps in particular were very important because that really has helped us document the, the impact of the sediment and then also when the sediment actually stopped being an impact. So we had three of those that the Elwha tribe runs in the main river uh, and then also two in clear water tributaries of Indian Creek and Little River between the former two dams. And what happened with, with uh, Chinook is a good example of what happened with a lot of the species where we didn't see much of a change in the smalt production even after dam removal in 2014 and 2015. But once the sediment started to clear, we saw a pretty pronounced increase going from uh, about, I would say, a, a quarter of a million fish on average uh, out migrating to almost a million uh, Chinook uh, smalt out migrants. We haven't seen some fish return yet um, in terms of numbers, although we're starting to see adults increase in numbers uh, with chum and pink salmon. Um, but you know, in terms of juveniles, still, still kind of being felt that that impact being felt. We have seen other species really kind of take hold. Uh, Pacific lamprey, in particular, have shown a 12-fold increase in in three years following dam removal. And we see sockeye. We've done some genetics work on the sockeye, and even though we have Lake Sutherland and a kokanee population, the genetics is telling us that most of the sockeye we're seeing are strays from Alaska and British Columbia, at least that those are the closest populations and those are mostly river type. In terms of the extent, um, uh, we've seen bull trout, which are were above the dams before and, 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 um, uh, and then below as well, going furthest up, followed by summer and winter steelhead being up all the way up to the headwaters here and then Chinook, Although we're not seeing as many Chinook in the upper portion of the basin, um, with sockeye, pink, and chum, we're kind of seeing them in the middle part. Um, and we actually started to see pink and chum above uh, former Glines Canyon Dam. So in terms of the total number of reds that we've seen above, again, this is not a comprehensive uh, estimate, but just for our index reaches in places, we've gone from zero to about at least a thousand reds cumulative for the three species per year. And so when we think of dam removal, we think of the dams coming down and we think of fish going upstream, but we don't really think about what was above the dams and what might be able to come downstream like bull trout and then go back up or uh, basically uh, rainbow trout that were above uh, the dams. And then now steelhead can certainly get up there. 
Um, and then we have offspring from both the resident and the and the um, and the winter steelhead that can migrate out, but actually can come back in different life history strategies too, such as summer steelhead. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So we've seen a reawakening of summer steelhead in the Elwha. We went from uh, a numbers in the low single digits to observing over 300, particularly in the area with the big circle here on the right. Um, and um, we asked the question, well, where are these guys coming from? Are they basically from the anadromous fish below? Are they from the resident fish above? Are they strays coming from other places? And so we started to look at a variety of different uh, configurations in terms of base of genetics, whether it's alleles or, or other markers uh, with Kristen Nichols and Al Alexandra Frake. And what we're finding is that when we look at the adult returns and you look at the timing of the adult returns, and this is thanks to the work of the species composition that occurs that complements the sonar work, is that we're seeing the greb one l marker, which is basically a summer genotype, in the steelhead that return in June, July, and August, but we don't necessarily see that marker in the fish that are returning as winter fish in March, April, and May. So a lot of times on the peninsula, they'll try to denote May as summer, as the kind of the start of summer, but based on the genetics we're seeing here, really it's the fish that are coming in in July, August, and September, and October that more have more of that summer steelhead genotype. So when we started looking at it a little bit deeper with a larger source, so we're talking about all the different um, if you look down here in the bottom right, we have a sample of over 2,600, you know, par, smolts, adults from all over the basin. And if you look, we could, we definitely have the summer geno, uh, summer homozygote in the summer fish, the winter and the winter. But when we look at the whole thing in the top right here, so AD is above the dam, ID is in between the dam and BD is below the dam. You could see that almost 75% of the samples we had prior to dam removal had the greb one l marker. And so really what was happening, it seems like we hypothesizing is that this life history strategy was basically held up above the dams. And once the dams came out, their offspring were able to go out to see and become summer steelhead. So we're seeing them down the system all the way down to BD. And conversely, we're seeing winter fish all the way up. So now we're seeing this mixing that wasn't occurring before. So we've also seen other things like bull trout being able to go downstream and that's had, that's had a pretty pronounced change in their condition factor. So this is a work that was led up by Sam Brinkman and others from the park service. You could see in the upper left what our typical bull trout looked like prior to dam removal. And then on the right, what we're, what we're seeing now with some of these fish above um, and obviously with this fish puking in the upper right hand side, um, it's basically pointing out the fact that they're getting different types of nutrients in the marine system and we're seeing a lot more interaction for those upper upriver fish. We're also seeing kind of life histories reawakened even, even though they're not necessarily genetically different. So here's a, a good example of Indian Creek, which is a low gradient warm system and Little River, which is a steep steeper cold system and they come in within a tenth of a kilometer of each other. And so what we've seen there, which is really cool, is that we have different kind of species composition. We have kokanee and cutthroat uh, in, in Indian Creek, while we have mostly rainbow trout and little river. But really this gets to how temperatures uh, can maybe help with uh, the reawakening of life history strategies. So we have month on the x-axis and average temperature on the y. And what we're, I want you to focus on is this two month difference in uh, upper Indian Creek and even lower Indian Creek versus Little River. Little River is cold. And so there's a two month growth advantage if you're assuming that growth is really optimal between nine and 19 degrees C that happens in Indian Creek. So what does that mean? Well, what we're finding is that within the first generation of fish that are genetically the same, so these are coho, we're seeing in Indian Creek, both fry coming out and smolts coming out of the system. Whereas in Little River, which is colder, we're seeing them come out later and the vast majority move out of that system very quickly and don't smolt in that system. They go downstream and, and, and rear in warmer waters downstream. So pretty interesting how the environmental conditions can affect life history as well. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other parts, uh, the benthic food web. And this is work that's been led up by Sarah Morley and US, and then from, from our shop and Jeff Duda from USGS. So physical habitat changes like I've talked about, and that has a change in primary production, secondary production, and then the consumers as well. 
and and uh, Sarah and Jeff set up some really nice study designs looking at below the river, below the dams, between the dams and above and different habitat types, and then partitioned out over time the pre-removal and during and after removal. Um, and I'm just going to focus on the lower kind of the in between the dams and below the dams for now. But what they found was that before dam removal, we had um, densities of up to 3000 inverts per square meter. And then we saw a 95% reduction during the dam removal, which makes sense in terms of all the sedimentation. But then we saw this huge increase after the sediment kind of routed through the system and a change in species composition as well. We also saw a change in what these fish are actually eating. So these are, uh, uh, Sarah and Jeff did some, some work uh, looking at what their diet content was, whether it's aquatic or terrestrial. And what we found was that prior to dam removal, you could see most of the bars above, below the dams in the blue, meaning that they're aquatic. But during the dam removal, we saw a shift because we saw a dramatic decline in the inverts to basically terrestrial, uh, terrestrial food source. One of the cooler stories was developed by Chris Tonra from uh, the Ohio State University um, and uh, looking at American dippers and what they eat. So American dippers like to eat salmon eggs and they like to eat insects and they're basically riparian obligates. And what he did is he looked at areas where there was anadromy in the yellow and areas where there wasn't anadromy in the red prior to dam removal to take a look at what their uh, marine derived nutrient signal was, their size, so on and so forth. And what Chris found was that once the dams were removed and salmon were able to get into these areas they haven't been in in over 100 years, we saw a higher survival of, of these animals uh, in those areas and they became more resident. So they banded a bunch of them. And prior to dam removal, particularly in the middle of where these animals were migratory and they became more resident and they were 20 times more likely to have multiple broods. So a pretty quick ecosystem response to dam removal. So wildlife um, in the former reservoirs is really kind of popping up. And this is work by Rebecca McCaffrey and, and Patty Happy and um, a variety of other people looking at a diverse array of animals, including elk and cougars, bobcats, weasels, and woodpeckers, and Kim Sager Fratkin. So small, small mammal abundance and diversity increased immediately with the increased smaller vegetation. Um, I just love that photo, sorry. Um, and uh, beavers have successfully colonized both of these reservoirs and um, deer and elk have been found to uh, above the former reservoirs. And we started seeing the larger animals as the trees basically started to come in. And there's continuing efforts to monitor this. So there was a lot of vegetation change. This is a work by Pat Shafroff and others looking at how the Delta expanded and pioneer vegetation, particularly in those intertidal water body, bodies of emergent of marsh vegetation. Um, we've seen a increased uh, plant diversity on new gravel bars and older gravel bars with the influx of sediment and different vegetation trajectories in the former reservoirs. So if you're talking about the valley walls, um, something different than the high terraces, something different than the floodplain. So particularly, we've seen a lot of, uh, in, you know, in the finer sediments, we've seen much higher success rate for vegetation than the coarser sediments. So in some, the dams have been removed and over half of the sediments stored was released. Most of that was transported to the Strait of Juan de Fuca to basically, uh, that was taken away and then also created the estuary that you see that new 60 acre delta, hectare delta, um, and that 10% of the river uh, stored sediment has been in river changing things like spawnable gravels and habitats. Um, a, adult salmon are making it above the former dams in the hundreds to the thousands in some years. Uh, both hatchery and wild fish are contributing to the spawning population and we're seeing other uh, uh, species like Pacific lamprey growing in numbers and changing changes in growth benefits and the reawakening of life history strategies such as the summer steelhead. We've seen a, we saw a dramatic reduction in benthic inverts, but now they're making a comeback and we saw that shift in diet, which we thought was pretty cool and how that's changing back and changing migration behavior of American differs and increasing their productivity benefits. And then obviously the vegetation changing due to the dam removal and the sediment flux and the creation of new landforms that have different vegetation associated with it, whether you're talking about the delta, the river, or the former reservoir areas. 
I was going to make this font smaller for you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's a lot of publications and um, uh, there's a lot of people to thank. And um, I can give this to folks if they're interested. And that's it. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Great. Thank you so much for that, George. I love hearing um, about the fish, of course, but um, it's also really neat to hear about some of the, the other animals, um, the invertebrates uh, that are coming back as well. And just the, just the, the full ecosystem response is, is very cool. Um, so thank you for sharing some of that. Um, sure. There are just a few questions right now in the chat. So I would encourage everyone to go ahead and drop your questions in chat if you have anything you'd like George to address further. Um, so starting with the first question that's that's shown, um, and I think you may have had this in your presentation already, but is there any pictures or maps, drawings of the Delta area pre-dam? Yes. Uh uh, do you want me to repeat the question again, or you got? Is that okay for you just repeating it there, just Kathy? Yeah, just... I can just repeat. It. Are there any pictures or maps, drawings of the Delta area pre-dam? So I guess to yeah. compare what it was before the dam was added, and then now that it's been taken away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I showed you a picture of one of them actually, but yeah, uh, uh, the USGS and John Warwick have done a very good job of documenting the change prior to dam removal, and then and then. Um, during dam removal and post dam removal. So there's definitely all that kind of information. So I think what they're asking though is before the dam was even put in, is there anything known yes. about the Delta? Yeah, yeah, there, there is actually, there's some historic maps. If they're talking about historic information, there is historic maps from uh, the GLO notes, the general land office notes. And Jamie Michelle uh, actually gave a presentation at the Elwha Sciencescape this year and showed a beautiful map that ironically looks very similar to what we're seeing now, uh, you know, in terms of that kind of when the dam removal was happening, um, you know, the, the, the delta was pushing out, but with all the wave action um, from the strait, it's now basically kind of squished it and moved it eastward, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Great. Um, question, any explanation for the loss of steelhead in South Branch of Little River? Little River. There was never any steelhead in the South Branch of a Little River to start with. We just use it as a base because there's a there's a waterfall that nobody can get above. So the fish above have always, well, not always, but have been resident for quite some time. All right. Uh, is there still hatchery fish production? And if so, when will it end? You know, it's a good question. Yes, there's still hatchery fish production, and we developed an adaptive management plan um, that has kind of different steps to it. And so uh, the hatcheries are supposed to sunset at a certain point. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but if anybody's interested, I could give them the adaptive management plan and they could look at the kind of the guidelines that were developed in there to see when they'll basically go offline. Okay. Um, what is the overall gradient from Glines Canyon Dam reach to the confluence? Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's, it, it's a relatively steep, uh, steep river, I guess, for, you know, in terms of short chunks, chunks of it. But uh, I can give that to somebody if they're interested so they can contact me via the, you know, my, my, my email, george.pesantnoah.gov, and I can, I can give you that answer. All right. Uh, can you comment on the public response to the movement of sediment over time? Complaints, neutral, positive, silence, in acceptance. It's a good question. You know, I um, I haven't heard much, to be honest with you, about it. Um, there was a lot of questions before the dam removal, but I haven't heard either positive or negative about it, really. Um, even when we had the Elwha Sciencescape this summer, you know, people were just asking what happened more than mm. posing judgment on what happened, I guess. So I think, I guess my answer would be neutral at this point. I mean, it, the, the public has been relatively objective about it um, for the most part, I think. It's good. <laughs> um, all right. Can you remind us what tools, computations were used to predict duration and volume of sediment transport out of the reservoir, and how did that compare to the monitored outcomes? Uh, and then second part question, any recommendations for dam removal sediment transport projections based on this experience? 
Yeah, I mean, so, I'm not I'm not the right person to talk about the the estimates prior to dam removal, but I could put you in contact with them. In terms of what I've seen, um, and, and I think the the best people to talk to would be Jennifer Bountry and and uh, from the Bureau of Reclamation and Tim Randall, who's retired now. He was with the Bureau Bureau of Reclamation as well. But relative to what they estimated and what we saw, it was pretty comparable. It was definitely within the same order of magnitude. Um, they did a really good job of managing the sediment. And I would just say, um, you know, in terms of recommendations for future dam removals and sediment transport projections, I would say talk to Jennifer and the Bureau of Reclamation, um, as well as USGS and people like Andy Ritchie, um, uh, because they did a really good job of managing people's expectation and monitoring that component of the dam removal, which was considered the most um, uncertain. Yeah, and we, we have that Jennifer and Tim, uh, they co-presented a couple years back. I was just scanning our, uh, our, our website to see if uh, their presentation had been recorded or not, but uh, it might be, might be time to get them back on and uh, give an update to everybody. Okay, um, what are your thoughts on the efficiency of the jump start moving fish upstream required under the BO based on what you know now, would you have recommended to do it? So the efficacy of the jump start of moving fish upstream. Um, well, we didn't necessarily move fish upstream. What we did was move fish out of harm's way. So in other words, uh, we didn't, uh, with the exception, well, no, that's not true. Actually, we did move some coho upstream. Um, I think that um, the jump start helped for some species and didn't help as much for other species. So for example, I think for coho, it was a really important component because and, and I think the answer is it varies. How would I recommend I would vary by species? What we found with the coho is they didn't stray much at all. In other words, they all pretty much went back to the hatchery. So we really weren't getting fish into other parts of the watershed because um, their stray rate was so low. So moving the adults into clear water areas for, I think it was a period of three years, we saw that 95% of the spawners uh, were based on our Floyd tags were, were fish that we moved. But then by the fourth year, in the fifth year, we saw less than half of the fish in those areas with Floyd tags, meaning those are fish that were probably from the, you know, reared, in, you know, uh, born in those areas, re you know, reared in those areas and then came back as adults. So I think for coho, it was a pretty effective uh, uh, tool. I think for some other species like Chinook and for steelhead, it might not be, it wasn't as needed per se. Um, because of their stray rates and their ability to kind of get into areas. So I think it varies by species. Uh, what was the most unexpected change that you saw because of the dam removals? What is something you expected to see because of the removal but did not? Okay, so uh, the most unexpected change, I guess for me personally, the most Unexpected change wasn't something that was unexpected in terms of happening, but how quickly it happened. And that was the reawakening of summer steelhead. I didn't show you the population estimates, but within four years of dam removal, our estimate for summer steelhead was about a thousand returning in that year. And that was bigger than actually what the Clearwater got in the Columbia that year. And, and that to me was a, a surprise because we didn't really understand when we were talking about dam removal about the role of the grab one l marker and mar and you know a predisposition for different kinds of migration so those th those are those are new contexts those are new things that happened as we were kind of going with the dam removal so i think that was the most unexpected thing uh what was something that i expected that i didn't see um let's see what was something that was expected that i didn't see i guess um one thing that I expected that I didn't see was uh, kind of sediment moving out of the side channels. So I thought sediment would get into the side channels personally, but I thought that they would eventually kind of defill, but that's not what happened. And it makes sense if you think about Western Washington and how quickly things revegetate. So once that fine sediment got into areas, basically that whole area of veg, a lot of places vegged up before the sediment could be moved again. And so it got locked up. So that was a, that was unexpected, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this question came in pretty close on the heels of the other one. So I'm not sure if you have much of a different answer, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it anyways. Um, is there anything 
that went totally different from what pre-removal, from a pre-removal prediction, either morphological or biological. I will add one other thing that was nobody, nobody talked about, and that was the role of organics uh, in the lower reservoir. So we had a pulse of organic material that really resulted in a, a pretty low DO level in the river for a short period of time. But nobody really, like when they did the, the modeling on the reservoirs, nobody, nobody was thinking about like the seasonal accumulation of organics in these reservoirs and when they pulse out like because you know basically mm -hmm. you're talking about um you know an anoxic condition so things don't degrade very quickly and so there were these just organics that kind of pulsed out that was kind of a unique thing that i didn't you know, nobody really thought about okay um questions keep stacking up so uh, as long as we're still before the end of the hour i think we'll keep going asking questions um, I think this one is a question of clarification. Did you say there was an increase in predation on terrestrial insects following dam removal? Yeah, there was actually uh, during or during dam removal. And, and that was because there were no aquatic insects. So basically, you know, uh, if you go to the supermarket and you don't have 20 kinds of cereal, you only have two, you're going to buy one of two. And that's what kind of happened with, you know, these with with the with the with the fish is that the terrestrial ones were the only ones basically coming into the system at that time. Okay. Um, question on if um, how local tribes have been involved in uh, and impacted by the removals. Uh, the local tribe, which is the Lower Elwha Clown tribe, was integral part of the removal. The way they've been impacted is that they actually developed a harvest moratorium that's still going on, ongoing for fish in the Elwha. So they they came up with a harvest moratorium on salmon during this time period that eventually will change, but that's a pretty big impact. People have not been fishing on the Elwha fish, and that's part of the reason why we've seen the recovery happen as, as has. All right, what effects have, have the hatchery had on repopulation thus far? Uh, well, that's a big question. Um, so uh, for it varies by species. For Chinook, uh, the hatcheries were a really big part of the population before dam removal. They still are, but that's changing as we're seeing the increase in smolts. Um, for steelhead, uh, there was a smaller hatchery operation, um, and they've contributed to the to the to the recovery of the of them, and and we're seeing. Uh, uh, more and more natural origin fish there. Uh, for coho, it's been part of it. But again, same kind of story, similar to steelhead. So they've been part of the whole thing. But as the populations grow, you could see that kind of eventually changing. Great. Okay, I have one more question listed. If for some reason I missed your question, please retype it in here or uh, or all this. This will also be last call for questions here. Um, all right. Another one came in. So I have two more questions. Thoughts on recovery of former numbers of pink salmon? Yeah, that's a really good question. We're starting to see the numbers grow. I don't think they'll ever get to the level that we saw historically. Um, I think that they were too impacted prior to even the the dam removal. Um, you know, we had low numbers of pinks before that. So I would be very surprised if we saw really historically large numbers of pinks, but I think we can get them in the thousands, but I don't think we're going to get them into the tens or hundreds of thousands, um, simply because we lost a lot of that um, just historically, even by the, you know, the 40s and 50s, most of them were gone. So it's hard to recover something that was lost, you know, decades before, so to speak, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Last question I have, how polluted... How polluted were the sediments in the reservoir? Could you estimate the amount of organic carbon in the sediments? Uh, so the first question, they were not that polluted at all since most of it was coming from Olympic National Park. So it wasn't like there was a mill or something like that upstream, you know, that resulted in, you know, toxic materials and stuff like that. Uh, I'm sure you can estimate. Um, I don't know what the organic content level was in the sediments, but I could I could help that person point them to somebody that might know that, but I don't know it. Okay. Um, and maybe you can uh, give out your uh, email address for a couple of these questions that might have some follow-up needs. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put it in. I'll just type it in the chat right now as, as we're going. Okay. So go ahead with the next question. Great. So uh, a few more questions have come in. I guess they 
threatened by my last call. <laughs> All right. I noticed when you mentioned observations, it doesn't spit it doesn't specific. It isn't specific if these are visual observations or observations based on collection with fish traps. Are there any fish traps being used to collect the data? Fish traps, yeah. Well, we have, well, we for adults, uh, we have sonar. So we're enumerating with sonar there. We also have a weekly species composition where we're netting to get the composition of the species. For for smolts, we have screw traps, which are traps <laughs> and uh those are that's out migrating you know smolts uh that were that were enumerating again with you know the elwa the elwa is kind of like got an, an a minus to a rating in terms of the enumeration that's happening because we're actually we actually have confidence intervals on all our estimates not only do we have confidence intervals but we could tell you what the components of the variation are within the confidence interval so we could tell you how much is observation error versus process error so i think that um uh, I think from an enumeration perspective, we happily give people all the information they want in terms of our reports and stuff like that. I see a couple of other questions. Should I go for it? Um, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and read them out loud, though, so that the recording okay. makes sure it picks yeah. it up. So one specific one, are you seeing cutties? I assume that means cutthroat trout. Well, there's a couple in the chat that you didn't pick up yet. That's why I was asking. Uh, I still have a few more showing up below that question. Okay, so what so cutties is that the question? Yes. So cutties are interesting. We haven't seen any sea run cutthroat. We're kind of wondering why that is. We definitely have cutthroat in one system in Indian Creek, um, and we have them in parts of other systems, but they're really not that prevalent for some reason in the Elwha, and we don't really know why. So we're trying to investigate that a little bit more. All right. Um, is there anything you wish you would have monitored that you haven't? That's a really good question. I think one of the things that we really wanted to monitor was uh, was bed scour, but if anybody's ever monitored bed scour, that's a lot of time and effort. Um, and we just were, we might we monitored fine sediment, we monitored habitat changes, and we just didn't have enough time and energy and people to do everything. So I would say that bed scour would be something that I would wish we monitored from a geomorphic perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's an interesting comment here from from Rich Gross. Uh, your presentation has inspired some scientists who began our careers out there in the 1980s to a reunion this summer, out on those new delta sediments. So that's awesome. It's great. Oh, it's great. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, one more question: Was there active restoration at the tributary mouths in the reservoir footprints following drawdown? If so, were there any helpful lessons learned? So the answer is no. There wasn't any real active. Uh, uh, restoration that happened uh, in the at the tributary junctions. There was a lot of active restoration in the lower river by Mike McHenry, who built a bunch of constructed log jams down there that actually really made a difference in terms of how the sediment moved through the system and what resulted as a result of the increase in sediment, which was larger pools and stuff. So I would say that Mike's Mike's work there was really important. Um, there was definitely active restoration that occurred in the reservoirs themselves in terms of revegetation, and I would really tell people to talk to Josh Chenoweth, who now works for the Yurok tribe and is working on the Kalamath Dam removal as well. Great. Um, all right, another one came in. Is the exposed land from removing the dam replanted or naturally regrowing? Both. Uh, yeah, so there was a mix. It was a mixed thing of natural revegetation and then also some replanting. And I would, again, Josh Chenoweth has done a really good job. Um, and he was did a, such a great job that he got hired to do it also in the Kalamath. So that'll be good to have that kind of connection. But yeah, there was definitely a mix. And I would just say this is that the, in the short run, it was the finer sediments that really were successful. So um, and, and then getting the stuff that actually nitrogen fixed early in there, like lupin really made a difference in, in certain areas. And eventually the trees came in as well and willows started to come in as well. So. All right, one more has come in. Was there any reciprocal benefits between the Elwha restoration and the Deep Creek intensively monitored watershed? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I think I think Mike learned a lot. Mike McHenry, who's the head habitat biologist for restoration with the Lower Elwha tribe, learned a lot doing constructed log jams in both of those areas. So Deep Creek, for those that don't know, is west of the Elwha. It's a small watershed west of the Elwha. 
Um, and we actually just got a paper published on kind of what Mike did out there. But basically, I think there was some lessons learned in the sense that Mike changed kind of how he thought about wood and the role of wood. And, um, and I think that those were value added lessons for his design stuff. Mm -hmm. um, did you see any arrival of undesired fish, uh, like an ah. invasive species? That's a really good question. Um, really haven't. Actually, we saw a decrease in brook trout. So um, the, the analogy I like to give is the 300. So everybody hears about King Leonides when he you know, went against the Persians. I'm a Greek, so this is why I know this. But anyway, um, but you know, everybody talks about how brave King Leonidas was. Well, last time I checked, he lost because there were 10,000 Persians and 300 of his guys. And I think that's what happened with brook trout in the Elwha. And that is um, once the anatomist fish showed up and they have thousands of off, you know, thousands of eggs versus hundreds of eggs, they actually started taking over places uh, in the off channel areas where brook trout, we, we used to see brook trout. So I think that anatomy can kind of help with reducing certain kinds of evasive species like brook trout. Uh, all right, great. Um, thoughts about rapid demolition and sediment release versus slower pulse release of sediment. Uh, pull the band-aid off quick and get it over with, uh, with very high suspended sediment concentrations or a more gradual release over years. Uh, it's a really good question. And I, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask. I, I definitely think that Jennifer would be a better person to ask about that. And Andy, my impression is that we had to do it that way in the Elwha for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, and I think from a biological perspective, you know, depending on what you have below in terms of population size and the amount of river and the amount of habitat and the amount of um, kind of areas that might be refuge, I think that would play a role in it and how much sediment you're actually releasing. So I, I would say that if you're, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a good question. I don't, I don't have a good answer for you right now though. It's, it's a good question. Oh, hey. All right. Well, we did get to the end of our questions, and that's good timing because we do need to end things here. Um, okay. George, thank you so much for this. You're this welcome. has been amazing, um, and it will be posted up on our on our YouTube page um, in a few weeks' time. So, um, you know, if, if you know somebody who needs to check this out, make sure you check our our website for when it's reposted. And George, thanks again for your work and for your time with us today. We appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for the great questions, everyone. And, and, and please go ahead and email me if you have more questions. I tried, I'll do my best to answer it, put you in contact with somebody, okay? Awesome. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good day. Okay, bye.